So, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Catherine Mean, and I'm chair of the Germany Group, which is partly relevant to what we're talking about today, but not totally. Uh, you're most welcome. Could I ask you to turn off your mobile phones, please? Uh, could I say the main, our paper, our speaker's main talk will be on the record, and after that, the question and answer will be off the record. So, we're, I think, quite privileged today to have Dr. Stefan Heumann with us. He's a member of the management board of the Foundation for New Responsibility in, based in Berlin, and his topic is China, the United States, and Europe, Germany's AI strategy in a global context. I mean, as some of you probably know, um, Germany, after I think some internal moments of panic, came together and has it launched its AI strategy in December of last year. So what we're talking about at the moment is about as new as it could be. What's also interesting is, is the nature of Dr. Heumann's Stiftung, the way it works, its interface with the different stakeholders in the whole area of artificial intelligence. So I think we can look forward to a very interesting and informative talk. Thank you very much. Um, this will get into my presentation, I assume. Yes. Um, for the audio, I probably should speak into yes, the please. microphone. Please. Okay. All right, perfect. Thank you very much, Catherine, and um, thank you very much also for the invitation to Dublin. I'm very pleased to be here and talk to you about AI or talk with you. I'm also interested to learn um, the Irish uh, perspective on this topic. Uh, my organization, Stiftung Neue Verantwortung, is a, is a think tank really focused on technology and public policy. We are a team of 20 people based in Berlin. It's a non-profit and we are non-partisan. And we um, really work uh, both with the tech sector, um, with government officials, but also with NGOs um, and academics and really try to bring them to, together to develop expertise because we don't think that you can find the answers um, how to react and assess this rapid technological change you know, just at your desktop. You really have to go out and build networks and find the experts, engage in conversations um, with them. And about uh, more than two years ago, in 2017, we had a conversation with the German Foreign Ministry, um, which is a, a close partner, and we run a lot of projects with them. And they were um, interested in a project on a new technology that's kind of on the horizon that they should start thinking about. Because, I mean, they were self-critical and, and said, like, we, we didn't really, um, um, we kind of missed um, the, the internet uh, trend. We got to that very late, you know, digital diplomacy, you know, communicating on social media, the new issues that came up, um, cybersecurity, um, su such a big topic now in international affairs. This time, um, we reacted to that, we built capacity, but um, um, other countries were leading. Um, this time, we want to be a little bit more proactive, and we want to understand more early on um, how new technologies could change international affairs. And so we were talking, they were really intrigued about the digital economy and everybody was talking about that we're moving into a data economy and all these big US platforms. And we said like, yeah, everybody's talking about the 21st century um, is um, the century of the data economy. And if that's true, then artificial intelligence is going to be the key technology of the 21st century. And we should really be looking into that because we have so much data now, every one of you carries a mobile phone, um, uh, we have uh, getting connected cars, we're getting connected home appliances, um, the internet of things. There's so many things out there and they're, they're producing so much data that we can use. No human being can look at that and analyze that. We will need intelligent automated systems that make sense of all that data. And that's basically what under this catchphrase of AI we are talking about. We are talking about tons of data that is out there that no human being can process in any way meaningfully. And we need systems, computer systems, um, that help us um, to make sense of that data. And so AI is going to be a key technology if, as we moving into that connected um, data-driven um, world. And so we started out um, like we usually start out. Um, we do a research sprint. Um, we look at what we can find, you know, could, could we find any papers and publications on AI and foreign policy? We didn't find very much. 
But um, we did find um, AI experts, and we were talking to diplomats, and we, struct um, and, and we structured an initial input paper around that and started a conversation with them. And in part of that research and looking internationally, we found, of course, uh, what everybody of you has heard about, this global race for AI that um, is largely led by the big tech companies from Silicon Valley, um, that also China has now um, produced a very ambitious strategy for AI, and China wants to become a global leader in this technology by 2030. They have also identified that as a key technology moving forward. And we've, we've also seen that inside of the EU, other countries were really working on AI. We saw that Great Britain was having discussions on an AI strategy, that uh, France had um, started a process. And um, what we were frust um, frustrated about at that point is that Germany hadn't started yet um, working on an AI strategy, given how important that um, um, technology is. And um, Germany was a little bit reluctant um, um, to join that. And I will explain to you why. And uh, I also will show you the moment um, when that changed. So <laughs> that is Chancellor Merkel in, uh, in uh, early May 2018 on her visit um, to China. And when she visited China, she also went to Shenzhen. And some of you may have heard that Shenzhen is um, one of the AI hubs, and especially hardware hubs in China. And she was visiting um, startups there, here a, a robotic startup. And she was very, very personally, very, very impressed um, what the Chinese were already doing with that technology. And she came back from that trip, and she was really questioning um, her cabinet and her ministers what are we doing on this technology? And is it really good enough um, what we have been doing? And the question, is it really good enough what we have been doing in Germany? It's a, it's a longer going conversation that we are having about um, digital and tech because um, the German track record is not super great. Um, if you look if you look at this st statistic from that, um, that the EU has the Digital Economy and Society Index, and I marked for you where Germany is, it's right at the mid middle. You know, it, it sort of um, assesses kind of um, how well developed um, the member states are in terms of their digital economy and, and digital society, and they look at connectivity, they look at skills, human capital, they look um, at how widespread is the use of internet services. Um, they look at the integration of digital um, technology into, the compa uh, into companies and in the, in the business sector at large. And they also look at the, um, how digital public services are. And you will see that Germany is right at the EU average. And um, you probably pleasantly have noticed that Ireland is, uh, is ahead um, and is uh, in the, among the, the, the top groups. But there has been a long-going conversation in Germany that we have had for years that we are struggling um, to adopt our public um, sector to digital, that we need to um, 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 be more proactive in, in pushing um, digital technologies into our society, into our education system, but also into our business sector. And um, so the conversation about AI started at a point where you know, there was already a lot of sort of criticism on the German government that we are not um, um, strong enough and not um, 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 doing enough at the moment. And um, so Germany um, joined that race um, late. They decided we really need to turn this around and, and, and we really need to um, move Germany forward. And, and you can see that we followed um, a trend um, that has been going on globally, that a lot of countries um, have been adopting um, AI strategies. And this is from Tim Dutton, who um, wrote a blog um, entry that is artificial um, intelligence strategies that I highly recommend for anyone who wants to dig deeper into it. He um, constantly updates it and he gives you an overview of, in terms of where the discussion is in all these different countries um, that have um, started or already adopted um, AI national, um, national strategies. And you see we also have a process going on now on the European level, um, but we have um, quite some um, member states um, being also from the EU already been um, very active in the field. Um, I particularly myself like the Finnish AI strategy, so if somebody wants to look at a particularly innovative one, from my perspective, I recommend them um, to take a look at the, at the Finnish one. And uh, it's been translated into English, so you, you don't need to learn Finnish to read it. So, 
So what complicated the conversation in, in Germany is um, that AI is not a new research field in Germany. Uh, last year, um, the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence celebrated its 30th anniversary. Right? And um, this was uh, one of the reasons why the German government has been reluctant to adopt an AI strategy, because our research ministry has always been saying, we have been working on AI for 30 years. You know, we have a, uh, this is um, um, a very large um, research um, center that has um, several locations in Germany and a network of over 800 researchers that work in it. But they have been mostly working and focused um, on what's called symbolic AI. I mean, AI is not, AI is really not a, a new research topic. The traditional um, AI systems um, go a long way back uh, over, 50 year, um, over 50 years, um, people have been trying to make computers um, intelligence, uh, intelligent, and there's really um, two camps on how you approach it. And the traditional camp is um, what you see in this slide is the um, symbolic AI. That is, you start with knowledge, you understand something, and then you try with logic to tell the machine um, to follow that logic. So a very good um, example for a symbolic-based AI system would be, for example, systems you use um, for your tax returns. So there's lots of rules and uh, rules around, you know, if you're in this income um, category, these kind of rules apply and you can deduct this and that. And a lot of that you can translate into logic for a machine to learn and then the machine can help you calculate um, your taxes. You know, that's what's called traditionally an expert system. And that's um, the symbolic um, AI. The problem with the symbolic AI is when it gets really complicated, it's, you know, it's really complicated to translate that into logical systems that um, work consistently. For example, you know, how do you tr explain to that sort of system um, you know, to recognize a horse or a human being? Right? You have to say, well, it has to, you know, it has to have a nose and ears, you describe it, but you know, that monkeys have that too, and other animals, you know, how do you differentiate that? So that kind of approach also ran into lots of roadblocks. And what we're seeing now, uh, now really taking off in AI is the statistical-based approach, the data-based approach, which is we don't start from logic. You know, we don't um, start from knowledge that we understand um, what a human is and then we try to translate that into rules and if-when rules um, to a system that can apply it. We rather let the machine learn it based from data. So we give a machine lots of pictures of a human being and the machine will figure itself out the patterns behind a human being and get so good at the recognition of that pattern um, that it in, a, in the end can recognize human beings by itself. And that's um, the statistical and machine learning approach. And this machine learning approach is really what took off. And it's really what's driving around all the AI hype right now. I think the AI term, we can have a conversation how useful that is, because I, I don't think we're talking about artificial intelligence. We're talking about very specialized systems that can do very um, specific things that is very different from human intelligence. And the, really the big hype is um, uh, on machine learning is on training computers at certain tasks or at the ability to recognize faces, to recognize speech based of ma uh, on massive data inputs. And these are really um, the drivers um, of machine learning that have come together in the past years. So n neural networks um, is this learning-based approach and it's you know, derived neural, uh, from neurons. You know, this is how our brain functions. Um, it's, it was inspired by neurosciences and, and how the brain works and translated into um, um, computer software that simulates um, the learning process. Um, then we have data. And during the past years, um, data has just the availability of data has just exploded. The problem by neural networks didn't really take off earlier, even though we had um, um, the concept or concepts already developed uh, in the 1980s, was that you need a lot of computing power to um, build neural networks, especially deep neural networks. The, the, the better you want to get at the pattern recognition, the, the more layers you need in your neural networks, and the more computing power you need to do that. And we just didn't have that kind of computing power in the 1980s and, and, and 1990s to do that. And so when we started to have um, the computing power and also the large uh, availability of data, we had key ingredients in place. Um, there are two more 
um, that you need. Um, that's talent, that's people who are um, able um, to work with neural networks, um, to work with data, um, to write the algorithms, to put it together. And that's currently the biggest bottleneck because this, um, these breakthroughs are very new. We don't have so many people trained in this specialized um, area that there's a global competition um, for experts in this field. And that's why, why you read a lot about this in the newspapers that AI experts get these um, these very high salaries, why so many people get um, uh, moving into the tech sectors because, uh, from the universities because um, you just can earn so much money with this um, knowledge at the moment. And then I wouldn't underestimate this. This is why Silicon Valley was um, really leading in the application of machine learning is practical use cases. Why would you invest um, so much money in, in, in building comp computing power uh, in, 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 in analyzing data and hiring um, big talent if, if you don't have a specific use case. And Facebook and Google they, and, and other companies, uh, Amazon, they have the use cases. Amazon wants to make prediction of, predictions on what you want to buy. For that, they need to analyze all the data that you leave on the platform, and human beings can't do that. You, you want to automate that process. Google wants to show you relevant search results. Right? Also for that, they analyze a lot of data and want to make you auto, give you automated predictions. Um, Facebook wants to understand your interests based on your activity on the platforms. They even want to understand what kind of pictures you upload. Yeah? For that, they need um, image recognition to, uh, to recognize pictures, also to do, to do their content policing, um, because they don't um, want to hire millions and millions of people to do that. Right? So they have really the use cases um, to work with all their data, so that's the reason why they were pioneers in this. But the use cases are much larger now, and, and they go beyond um, the internet platforms. You know, they go um, towards diagnostics for medicine, they go towards smart manufacturing or mobility, and that's why we have this broader conversation um, how AI is a key technology um, all across industry and, and society. And um, there's a... a so everyone talks about um, China and the USA leading, and there's a, a great resource again if you want to see where the, what, what are the most important trends in the field. I highly recommend, recommend to you the State of AI um, report um, that um, two leading experts publish every year. And I actually, I don't, I don't even want to go into the, into the details of the slides, but they kind of, it builds on what I've said before. They look at, you know, they look at hardware, they look at data, they look at research and algorithms, um, and they also look at the commercialization. What worries me about um, their a, um, state of AI report is, you know, there's something missing there in my perspective. You know, where, where's Europe, right? They're talking about, um, you know, uh, as if Europe is not even in that race at the moment, and that is what uh, I'm very concerned about. If we follow the assumption that AI is such a key technology um, to make sense um, of data, we are moving into a data economy, we really need that capability. And we're looking at the state of AI report, um, the leading report that's cited by experts, and they're not even talking about Europe in their comparison. So what, what, what do we need to do? I think uh, we have waken up in Europe. Um, there's a lot of awareness um, about the importance of, of AI. I think that's well understood. And um, the European Union has um, started uh, a strategy uh, process. You know, they have already published um, a first um, paper. They had um, discussions with member states and a further agreement, you know, how to move, um, move the EU forward. But you see it's a, it's a long-term process. Um, and um, the EU... That's a high-level approach. They like to call their expert working groups high-level, you know, the high-level expert work group on AI, and things take time in Brussels. And Brussels is also, in my opinion, quite removed from the ecosystems um, that are driving the development of AI. So there's a very important role for member states to play. And the EU is actually also encouraging, in its own AI strategy, the member states um, to adopt AI strategies. So um, let's, um, let's talk about um, the German AI strategy and what it can, um, can be the contribution to Europe. Um, this, um, I apologize um, for this um, German slide, but what, what it shows you in Germany, so the, the lighter blue um, is the number of um, AI startups and companies 
and the darker blue is the number of AI research institutes. And what you will see is Germany as a federal state has pretty much equally distributed around Germany AI research institutes. But you will see that in terms of commercialization, um, it's really focused on a few cities. Um, it's Berlin, uh, Munich, and then um, to a lesser degree, there's, there's, there's Hamburg, um, but it's really the big cities in Germany, Berlin and Munich, that are the, the, the startup ecosystems for com commercialization of AI. And this is one of the biggest challenges um, for Germany at the moment, um, because we um, usually want to promote research and innovation across the country. We want to we want to have it across all the, uh, the the lender we call them across all the states, but we see that the ecosystems really take off um, in the big cities, and I think we have a similar challenge in the EU. Everybody wants to have AI research, um, but we really um, see that the strong ecosystems are based in cities. You know, the strongest AI ecosystems are in London, in in, in Paris. Um, in Ireland, I would imagine it's around here in Dublin. Um, in Germany, it's Berlin and Munich. Um, and so we need to, we either need to figure out how we um, strengthen um, the commercialization in these smaller, uh, in these smaller cities, or we need to just um, uh, accept the reality and say, well, we have these star uh, strong clusters, what's happening there, and we just need to focus on our policy there. Um, what you see is that, um, that, that uh, across Germany now, the different states are starting to look at their ecosystems and trying to promote them. This is the governor um, from the Green Party, the only Green Party governor in Germany, um, Herr Kretschmer, Mr. Kretschmer, um, who is signing um, a program for what they call the Cyber Valley, that's the state of Baden-Württemberg in the southwest, a very strong um, manufacturing um, machine producing area, also the, uh, the home to Mercedes-Benz, and they have developed a program connecting their research, um, their leading research institutes on AI with industry. And they're bringing in um, Bosch, um, they're bringing in Daimler, they're bringing in um, SMEs. Um, also Amazon is now developing um, an AI development center. These are kind of the local ecosystems that we, um, that we need to build. And that, that um, 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 is a contribution that we can make, thinking about what are um, our strengths in certain areas and how can we develop these ecosystems. The second challenge is data. The, US, uh, the, the, the big US platforms have lots of data and we've talked about that for machine learning you need large amounts of data. And we don't have these huge platforms in Europe at the moment. So we need to encourage companies and industries to collaborate and to share data. And this is an initiative in Germany, it's called um, the Industrial Data Space, that's trying to develop a platform where companies can pool data and work together uh, and share data. And, and, and for example, if you have lots of small companies um, that um, if they would um, come together and pool their data resources, they could develop much better uh, machine learning based algorithms than they could do on their own. You even see that the big car companies are talking to each other um, to collaborate on developing autonomous driving systems because even a huge car company it doesn't have enough resources. But I mean, this is a challenge. How do we make this? Um, how do we build platforms for them to collaborate? Um, I don't want to get. Uh, we can go more into detail in the Q and A if there's um, interest. One interesting way to do this is, for example, what's called federated AI. It's where you have the machine learning happening on site and then only what you learn, you share with others and um, so you develop a, a master algorithm basically that benefits from what many different places learn. And um, you could also use that in the health sector, you know, that you have um, patients, um, you know, diagno uh, um, algorithms that do diagnoses and what they learn and how they improve. You combine what's learned in many different hospitals um, the advantage when that happens on premise is that you don't have to transfer any data. You don't have to have a centralized data repository, but rather you learn decentralized and you just bring a centralized the results of the learning together. These are sort of technical approaches that I think for a European AI we need to look much more into because they are much more compatible um, with our values and with our ideas about data protection. 
And of course, um, skills. Skills is very, very um, critical. We were just talking about this over lunch. This is a traditional strength. Um, in Germany, we have a very strong um, apprenticeship model. Um, we have um, strong trade unions um, that work together with the companies um, to develop um, training and qualification courses. Um, we have a very educated workforce in Germany that also is used to have a say in the workplace, you know, that critical interacts with machinery, um, um, with management, with engineers, and we need to get them ready to understand machine learning, AI, um, as they are going to be working with it, and they need to be able to understand um, the basics of it. They don't need to be able to code the machine, but they need to be able to understand what are the limitations of the technology, what could go wrong, how can I help my engineers and my management to improve processes and use the technology. And I think here we have a really, uh, could have a cutting edge in, in Europe with our trained and high, highly qualified workforces, not only over China, but also in the US, as we are thinking about um, bringing AI into industry. And then um, here's um, the, what the EU could really do. This is an initiative also that came bottom up. Um, it's the so-called uh, the Alice letter. Um, it's a letter that was signed by leading machine learning scientists in Europe that are demanding for more um, European support to build centers of excellence on machine learning. You know, they see um, three challenges. You know, they see that first they argue that machine learning, um, as I told you before, is, is really at the center. Um, of this artificial intelligence revolution. Um, they, they think that Europe is not keeping up, um, that the leading research institutes are overseas at the moment and that China is building them and that we need to do more um, to develop um, academic research centers of excellence that are um, combined with industrial labs and testing. And um, to do that, um, to really have visibility, we should have um, a few of these flagship centers across the EU um, that uh, collaborate um, amongst each other and really show um, European excellence in AI research. But, and, and there's also but, um, you know, Germany is also the country of environmentalists about skeptics on technology. And I, to I showed you earlier um, the slide on the Cyber Valley. There are protests against the Cyber Valley in um, Tübingen, which is a small uh, university city where one of the leading research centers sits. People are protesting against Amazon um, developing a huge uh, research center there. Uh, and they're very um, concerned about you know, AI taking away their employment. They are worried about unethical AI. They are worried about um, this technology being used um, to fight wars, to develop weapon systems. So I think that ethical discussion is, is really important. There are um, legitimate concerns. And if you don't engage with the population, I think we will see a backlash against that technology. And we see some, um, some backlash already. And um, I'm concerned about it. I think some of, uh, many, much of the backlash is also um, based on, on misinformation about the technology because of the term artificial intelligence. I think people widely overestimate what's possible at the moment because it's not human-based intelligence. And if you look at the media reports, they like to, you know, they like to use images of human-looking robots you know, to visualize artificial intelligence. It's very far from how these systems work. But there are a lot of concerns in the broader population. Um, I think the main concern is about the, the people's wealth and economic opportunities. So what does that mean to their employment, to their future? And the other one is, I, am I going to be subjected to some sort of artificial system that decides over me, you know, whether I get a loan or whether I get a car insurance? And do I have any way to verify that the decision was being made fair? And that's why I do think um, that uh, the European focus also on talking about ethics and the framework for developing ethic guides, guidelines for trustworthy AI is a very important component of the European approach. Um, I like about it that they don't only have ethical guidelines that really center around putting that technology in the service of human beings, but that they also um, include um, um, recommendations um, for technical verification and governance mechanisms. So for accountability in AI is a technical problems, 
problem. How do I understand, you know, if I use a machine learning algorithms, how the machine learning algorithm learned and how it makes decisions? That's a technical problem. And it's also a governance problem. You know, what, what kind of rules should a company fully and adhere to when it thinks about training data, when it thinks about quality assurance, when it thinks about, you know, when can I put this into the marketplace? So the framework is a very important starting point for broader discussion about how we want to bring um, AI um, into Europe. And uh, that's it. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward for a lively uh, discussion on this. And yeah, thank you very much for your attention.